Alexi, what a massive honour. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, though, before, when I just tried to say your name, before yeah. we start recording, it set off Alexa. Is that a recurring yeah. problem? Um, it has happened before, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. No, I can't again. hear it. I'm setting it off now. Yeah, I just, I mean, it's an, it's an issue. Sometimes we watch films and something that sounds a bit like yeah that. well it's difficult for me because i have to you know i have to say what is i have to answer what's the population of the ukraine or i have to play uh, music by lou rawls because you know if people say alexi you know tell me a joke about a gynecologist <laughs> i have to do it you can do it for me a lot wittier and maybe more factual without yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's me joking otherwise i, I don't really get a legal letter from them but also um i don't know if you heard about them because they started um there was this phenomenon where apparently i'm not going to keep saying a name but the those devices started randomly laughing all yeah. over the country people yeah. it's really disturbing well they are you know they are laughing because you know they're laughing in triumph aren't they because you know we are their slaves but they do listen into you don't they if you if you're talking about you know uh, you know, Wellington boots, then you start getting inundated with offers of Wellington boots, don't you? Because the yeah, exactly. Listening, exactly. I mean, they are essentially spying on half of various yeah, yeah. corporations. Which I just is... want to start. How does tell me about lockdown? Come on, tell me about lockdown for you. Well, um, uh, well, actually, because I was watching your interview with uh, Stuart Lee, who I'm. This uh, you know the usual circular thing. I'm going to interview on my podcast uh, <laughs> <Love> it. <laughs> next week, uh, but it, I think it was a similar experience, really. In that, um, yeah, the first one, you know, you were you were you were taken with the novelty of it, and uh, you know, the, the streets being silent and so on and so forth. But I am, a, but I am also, I am a coronavirus survivor hero because I did, I have had the disease. Like, t tell me about that. I, I yeah. Should, uh, well, I, I um, so like um, again, like Stuart, I was um, I was two thirds of the way through a tour, and I'd played five nights in um, Liverpool, and um, I did the Liverpool uh, Literary Festival a, f a few months ago, and the woman said that my uh, my gig had been a super spreader event because uh, she knew at least thirty people who'd fallen ill. But um, that was the week that they also Atletico Madrid played Liverpool, and uh, although they weren't allowed to, football matches had been banned in um, in Madrid. They were allowed to travel to Liverpool, so I think that's spread it. But yeah, so I, anyway, I got I got back I got back from Liverpool on about I think it was like March the fifteenth or something, just before all the gigs were cancelled, and then a couple of days later, I had a I had um, yeah mild symptoms of a cold. A few days and then i suddenly just fell off the cliff and and um i was just very ill really just exhausted and my sense of i had this sudden sense of um burning rubber in my nose and then my sense of taste and smell disappeared and, and, and still hasn't fully returned uh, and then i was ill for about a week and then i kind of started to recover it um, i mean yeah that was my initial lockdown i'm glad you've i'm glad you've recovered that i'd say i mean without just lower it you know injecting misery into it but someone i know a uh left-wing academic named ed ruxby um at the ruskin college and he got long covid he he was 45 fit and healthy and he died over the weekend really? wow. just shows how potentially yeah it's an odd um great guy as well. disease, yeah yeah let's talk about i want to talk about you so you're, I mean, I find this fascinating because obviously I grew up seeing you on the telly, not to make you feel old, but I mean, I'm 36. I'm not exactly a spring chicken, let's be honest. Um, and I respect, you know, my, my dad, my dad's a woolly back, so he's not, not, uh, not the genuine, authentic uh, scouser, unfortunately. But you, of course, are a scouser, as anyone can listen to. I just want to tell you, talk about how you got, you know, into comedy and tell me about that alternative comedy scene in the 1980s because it was, a real focal point of dissent against the juggernaut of Thatcherism at the time. So I just want to hear about that, how you got into it and, and, and just how significant it was, I guess, for people who felt they were living under kind of cultural occupation in a very right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I mean, it, 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 it's hard. I mean, in a sense, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, I think I, uh, you know, both my parents were working class. My dad worked on the railways. And my mother worked for um, football pools, pools clock. Um, but they were both members of the Communist Party, so I had a slightly um, outre upbringing. Uh, but I was, I was always, you know, it's a very literary household and stuff. But uh, there's a lot of books about, and we went to the theatre. Um, although, you know, as I said, because they were in the Communist Party, when everybody else was going to see the Bo Beatles, I was going to see the Red Army Ensemble, which was a, a choir composed entirely of uh, KGB torturers who would um, sing Roll Out the Barrel. Uh, but, um, so, uh, yeah, I was very unacademic at school. I, But luckily... Yeah, it was a golden era. It was that brief era when working classes were allowed to go to university and stuff. And so I went to art school because I was good at drawing. I went to Chelsea. First of all, I did two years at Southport Art School where my mother actually went for my interview. And uh, then I, went, I, I got a place at Chelsea Art School and I was at Chelsea for three years. Then uh, I was basically unemployed for about five or six years. But um, a friend of mine, uh, whose parents were also in the Communist Party back in Liverpool, he uh, he, he he was doing a, a, a cabaret, a kind of fringe theatre production of uh, songs and poems of Bertolt Brecht. And he asked me to be in it because I'd been in the school play with him. Uh, and then that fell apart after a, a while, but there was me and one other guy left. And uh, I just had this idea that, you know, there was no... It, it's hard to describe, really, the you know, the comedy landscape, the live comedy landscape in, in Britain in the 70s, but it was not all there was really. There was a couple of folkies like um, uh, Billy Connolly or Jasper Carrot, like Harding, but they, they you know, they, they weren't kind of hip, you know. Um, but apart from that, it was just these terrible kind of racist working men's club comedians like um, Bernard Manning and stuff. And so I just had a sense that, uh, you know, there was a market, there was a gap there. And so I, me and this other guy, we started, we started doing a kind of a sketch show. There was also stand-up comedy. But our big, the big breakthrough was when Peter, Rich, uh, Peter Rosengart and Don Ward opened the comedy store in uh, 1979 in a strip club in Soho. And that, that was where, because although I'd been doing stand-up comedy, I'd been, I didn't know anybody else who was doing it. It wasn't a movement, you know, to... To have a movement, you need a, a kind of group of people. And through the Comedy Store, I met Peter Richardson, Nigel Planer, Rick Mayer, Adrian Evans, and then later on, uh, Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders, Keith Allen, Tony Allen. And, uh, you know, that was the start of the revolution that is, uh, that, that, that is the, you know, that is the start of, I was the MC as well. They offered me the job of MC, and it wouldn't have, you know, I was, I mean, uh, um, you know, British comedy would have changed anyway, but it, I, because I was, I kept the comedy store going in the early months, and it, it would have had a different character, I think, if I hadn't have, have um, kept it going. So I was, I just think that people like uh, Michael McIntyre and Jack Whitehall really, you know, they wouldn't exist without me, so they owe me a kind of royalty. If they just, you know, give me a small royalty, I'd be very grateful. Yeah, I think legally that's probably what's required. Really, there should it? be a, there should be a fund, really. Uh, yeah, founder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, they're missing. They're <laughs> not someone standing on your shoulder, just <laughs> stealing from your from your cultural contribution. Well, that's been noted. Yeah, I mean, when you look back at Thatcher, I mean, because obviously, I mean, I found it. You know, like I was. Well, I mean, when Thatcher was kicked, uh, beaten out, uh, I was six. I remember I was taking on a. I remember I was, uh, we lived in Falkirk in Scotland at the time, hence my impenetrable Scottish accent. And um, we went to my parents who were, your, your parents were communist, mine were the militant Trotsky's organization, for those who don't know. Uh, but I remember going on a march in Glasgow against the poll tax and blah, blah, blah. And I was brought, you know, Thatcher was the ultimate baddie. Yeah. It's like, you know, don't, if you're naughty, Thatcher will come and get you. <laughs> um, but just tell me, looking back, because it's a while now, obviously she was removed from office over three decades ago now. And um, that Thatcherism remains dominant in lots yeah. of different ways. So how do you look back at that whole period now? Well, it was, um, in a sense, it was very different. I mean, it was obviously there was half the country that 
hated her and they and, and they were the people who were our audience and then i suppose there was half the country that were in in love with her really and, and you know um uh i mean it was it was the beginning of what of what we have today i suppose a really you know a really polarized um you know, and there's, I mean, it's an illusion, really, isn't it? That, you know, there's this illusion that really Thatcher um, he sorted Britain out economically, whereas, in fact, you know, Britain had a much higher GDP, a much broader manufacturing base before she got into power than, than when she left power and, and, and now. And it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of lie that um, she, you know, rebuilt. I mean, she just essentially closed down all industries apart from the arms trade and um banking i always think really uh so you know sort of either, you know kind of kill people or rob them uh but it was um it, it, i mean it was uh i mean obviously the the, the, the there was the, the there was the all that had been it was different it was different in, and I know Stuart's always fascinated by this. It was different in that, you know, housing was still cheap. There was still council housing. There was still subsidized venues. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, there was the remains of that, all that kind of social capital that had accrued, but obviously it was started to be frittered away. There was, you could still go, um, you still got a full grant if you went to, you know, university or art school, and your fees paid and and everything. So all that still existed, but it was, um, you know, I mean, I was thinking of something like, uh, you know, I mean, the GLC, which provided a kind of alternative left wing power base uh, for to Thatcher, and she just abolished it really. And it's, I mean, that's extraordinary, extraordinarily anti democratic that she just. That they, you know, the Tories abolished. Uh, you know, I don't know whether it would happen in other countries, but um, that they just destroyed the GLC. You know, which was a fun, you know, highly functioning, highly efficient uh, local. You know, yeah. And, for those who don't know, the the Greater London Council and they uh, yeah. they um, obviously supported. I mean, they were pioneering. They supported, for example, LGBTQ organisations at a time that was very popular. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, they, they were. Um, they uh, put on City Hall, which is obviously just down the way from Westminster at the time, um, the House of Commons, didn't they? They put on the unemployment figures. Um, yeah. Put on this massive billboard uh, or flashing up above City Hall. Yeah. I always thought they were boasting about that, really. <laughs> but it always seemed a bit like they were like, well, how many unemployed people? Um, yeah. Uh, but it was, I mean, it was just, you know, it's, you know, we think of, 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 you know, of, of, of you know, at the kind of the 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 I don't know the the, the really um, anti-democratic state as being now, but that was pretty fucking bad, really. And also, you know, the miners' strike taking, you know, making the unions, um, you know, making the the, the union uh, leaders personally responsible for debts so that they would they could be put in prison and stuff. It's pretty fucking nasty shit, you know. Looking back, how would you compare this lot of Tories to the Tories you so hilariously and eloquently <laughs> railed against back in the 1980s? Well, um, you know, my parents, uh, yeah, I like to listen to alternative voices, really, of not of my political persuasion, in a sense. My parents, by and large, only like, you know, only like voices that confirm their worldview. So there's a journalist I like very much called Peter Oborn. Uh, who's very right wing, but is also uh, um, very principled, I think. Um, and he uh, he's just written a book about the rise of political lying, where he obviously talking about Boris Johnson, who's a, a, a compulsive liar. Uh, you know, has been sacked many times from you know various newspapers and stuff for lying and uh, from. The ministerial post, I think, and he he compared he sort of sees Thatcher as a, as a model of, of of probity, really. That she, uh, you know, she played by the rules. I'm not entirely convinced about that. That um, that Thatcher 
you know, was were kind of a model of ethics and uh, and kind of Corinthian sporting values. Well played, Sarah. I doff my hat to you. Uh, where you know, but I, mean, I tell, but I mean, what is different about today, and which is, I think, profoundly disturbing, and it's not just the government, but it's a a wider cultural problem. Is that obviously in in my day when I was coming up, it was advantageous to be left wing. The left wing uh, view, voices were encouraged, and you know, as part of the a vital part of the discourse, and it you know, it it kind of um, you know, profited your career to. Uh, to be left wing or pretend to be left wing as a comedian, and now I think very much left wing. You know, we are living through a, I don't know where we are in the kind of McCarthyite cycle, but that we are living through a period when left wing voices are under profound uh, attack, and uh, I think it's a very dangerous time that we're living through. And in that way, that's certainly true. I don't know whether whether Thatcher would have would have. I mean, certainly, I don't know whether. Culturally, she cared much one way or the other, but that is a huge difference between now and and then, really. I think. So, tell me what you think. What you mean by that? Let's flesh that out. Well, it's just you know the whole you know just the the, the suppression really of of uh, of um, you know socialism, socialist voices, attacks on socialist voices. Um, you know, you know, I'm clear, you know, specifically the um, the lies and distortions that were told about Jeremy Corbyn from the moment he, um, you know, took office. Really, that uh, that uh, you know, there was a there was a, a an extraordinary assault on you know a decent you know painting this decent, ridiculously honourable man. As a as a racist and as you know, the Russian spy and various other smears that they tried, and uh, you know, I think that that you know those those uh, those are, those are kind of attempts at McCarthyism are continuing attacks on you know Ken Loach and people like that, uh, you know, and it's it's uh, it's very disturbing. I think it's you know I, I, I um you know I think socialists. You know, there's a large there's a large group of people who believe in socialism in this country. They are not really their voices are not allowed to be heard. They're being paired from the Labour Party. Uh, they're being, I think, being there's, you know, they're being paired from the media, and uh, you know, it's just it's just me, really. I'm <laughs> I mean, on that, I mean, uh, because obviously, look, I'm not Jewish. I'm a I'm a guy. And, uh, I mean, on anti-Semitism, so my position was always that Jeremy Corbyn is clearly not anti-Semitic, and the vast majority of the Labour membership aren't anti-Semitic either, and a poor anti-Semitism. But that there was a minority who either were anti-Semitic, and I know that because I've got a Facebook page and I had to remove people who said gratuitously anti-Semitic things, and others who were just very tone-deaf about how they would speak about it and that caused upset amongst Jewish people including Jewish people I know who voted for Jamie Corbyn so it wasn't like they were kind of people who were not this predisposed to him they voted for him in both leadership elections so I just wondered about that because obviously look I always find this difficult to talk about not least yeah it's, it's a difficult yeah but, yeah but I, you know that there was I mean, I guess the way that Jewish people I'm close to explain it to me is that if you're part of a minority that suffered 2,000 years of persecution and at times things seem fine, you're accepted, and then just like that, the winds change, you have to move. And that's the history of being Jewish throughout history. There's this sensitivity. But I'm now goisplaining a Jewish person, so that's not great. <laughs> but that's, that's the position put to me and what I know people who... Take John Landsman. John Landsman founded Momentum. He was instrumental in the rise of Corbynism, both leadership elections. He helped run Tony Benn's deputy leadership campaign in 1981. And he would say there's a problem with anti-Semitism amongst the minority that has to be dealt with. And he's, I've seen the stuff he gets, and I'm kind of like, oh, my, grim. And I'm like, really? Yeah, I mean, that. so I just kind of think, I always called it walk and chew gum. 
that it's possible to believe that Jeremy Corbyn is definitely not anti-Semitic and the vast majority of Labour members aren't anti-Semitic. But don't you think that what, you know, Jeremy said that the, 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 you know, the scale of it was vastly exaggerated for political purposes? Don't you think that's the case? I mean, I suppose the problem I have with that is that I just think the kind of the best way of approaching it would be to say that wherever there's anti-Semitism, it's a problem and we should do more to get rid of it. I don't know. I mean, and that, because I know lots of Jewish people who would say, if you look at the statistics of reports about anti-Semitism, which the statistics, it's obviously a very small number, but there are lots, lots of examples of any for in, in society, most racism generally isn't reported. Um, and that the kind of more emotionally intelligent way to go about it is to go wherever it is, it's a problem and we need to do more to get rid of it. Um, but don't you think it's like bizarre that a lot of, you know, people who are being, you know, expelled from the Labour Party for anti-Semitism are Jewish? Don't you think that's just strange? You know, there are a lot of the, the, the you know, the, the people I know who were like, you know, actually like somebody like Moshi Makhova, for instance, who has been, you know, suspended is not, you know, is a is an Israeli Jew. Don't you think that's odd that uh, somebody like that can be suspended for anti-Semitism? Yeah, I mean... Don't yeah, you I think don't... it was weaponized? It is being weaponized to as an attack on... on um, on left-wing voices as a generalized attack because most most uh, people who are left-wing will be pro-Palestinian and therefore... Yeah, look, I, look, I'll be honest. I've, you know, because of my support for Jeremy Corbyn and for the Palestinian struggle for national self-determination, of course I've had that against me. But, I, I mean, I just always... When I speak to Jewish people, including Jewish people on the left, and I can see that they're anger and upset is real, that it's not contrived, it's real, then in the same way that if a black person was talking about their lived experience or a Muslim was talking about their lived experience, then I just think, you know, I have a responsibility to listen. And obviously there are, except that in any minority, there's always a range of views. But I just, it seemed that all the evidence pointed to the, a very large majority of Jews, including those who'd voted Labour before, seemed... You know, they, yeah, I well, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, clearly, there, are, you know, anti-Semitism is a real thing. There are multiple studies that show that people on the left are much less inclined towards hatred of Jews than uh, than people on the right or people of of no political persuasion at all, and that it was used as a, you know, it was used and is being used as a tactic. You don't kind of accept that. I think that you'd hope, you'd expect the left to be, because sometimes what I heard, and this is what I found a bit difficult, I think, was when people said um, that anti-Semitism exists in society and therefore it exists in the Labour Party. And of course, that's that's true. But if we're the left, we're like the vanguard against, we're not there to replicate the bigotries in society, we're there to destroy them. So if there's any bigotry in our ranks, that's a problem. And I just felt... So one thing I would think, I do think there is this issue, which is leftism, as I understand it, socialism understands capitalism as a series of competing power relations and social forces. It's kind of broadly Marxist perspective, I suppose. And there's another element, which is kind of conspiratorial, which doesn't see... Injustice is about competing social forces, but as about shadowy individuals pulling strings behind the scenes. And that conspiratorial mindset always leads to anti Semitism and has thought, I mean, anti Semitism is basically the deadliest conspiracy theories ever devised. So people will talk about the Rothschilds, who I think the 1000th, 100th richest family on earth, rather than the financial sector and finance capital. And I do think a small minority, and I do need to emphasize that, it's a small minority, are, end up attracted to the left when actually their mentality isn't of being of the left, which is a fighting injustice, but about fighting conspiracies. And there's a kind of weird tangent that's emerged. And I'd say that's a small minority. I just think yeah. 
the reason that many Jews, including left-wing Jews, felt aggrieved was they felt they came across that in their lived experience against them. And then there were people saying, it's all a smear, it's all a smear. And they felt like they were being gaslit because they were like, well, I've experienced this personally. Rather than them saying, I'm really sorry that you felt you you felt this and we need to do more to make you feel safe. I've said a lot. And again, I'm not Jewish and this is... Yeah, well, this, thank this you for coming on my podcast. And uh, well, I mean, you know, it's uh, I think I broadly disagree with your your analysis of what's happened. I think, you know, I, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, that left-wing voices are under attack. But, you know, I'm interested to hear you. Oh, they definitely are. No, I know that. Yeah. In, including, look, I mean, without getting a violin out, I've been being up by Nazis. I mean, the definitely left-wing yeah. voices are definitely, <laughs> definitely under attack. And, uh, you know, my timeline and my emails and all the rest of it and the number of... Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that not me not being on social media is... Uh, I can't. I can't. I mean, why? Why would you want to? Why would you want to just be assaulted by? You know, I mean, well, you, you've been assaulted by ourselves both physically and uh, online. But I mean, why? I can't never understand why masochism. anybody. Wants that, really. Sheer masochism. Because yeah. I don't think I'm going to lie on my deathbed thinking, "Oh, I wish I'd, I wish I'd spent more time arguing with Barry five six nine about why I'm really uh, a yeah. commie bastard." Um. On let's talk about Brighton Broadening out. So, in terms of talk about Labour now, generally, Keir Starmer, yeah. Labour. What are your uh, what are your thoughts? Fucking hell! Yeah, <laughs> not a fan. Not a fan. I mean, it. It. it you know. Well, well, it, it's sort of. You know. I mean, um, you know, my history is obviously that I was on the. Um, my, you know, it was on the on the more radical left, and I was completely uninterested in the Labour Party. It was only when uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, took over that uh, I thought there might be some possibility within the Labour Party. Um, and then uh, once, just one of the things I did in lockdown was once uh, once he'd, he, he, he'd left power, I actually read all these um, books about the Labour Party, the history of the Labour Party. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of the interesting things is that the kind of Corbyn phenomenon, it's not the first time that it's happened. That First of all, it happened with a, in 1935 with a guy called George Lansbury, who, again, I think, like, Corbyn was an entirely decent um, uh, principled man and was assaulted by the, the right wing of his party. Uh, and then, of course, Michael Foote, uh, and then Corbyn, really. But it, 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 it um, I mean, my, my feelings about the Labour Party before Corbyn and I, is that it really exists not to facilitate socialism, but really to, 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 to stop socialism. That it, it, it exists to drain off, you know, those, those socialist influences in, in Britain and really kind of bog them down in the kind of proceduralism and, uh, despair and uh, you know and really it's been the you know it's it's uh i mean i, I suppose it's also that's a flaw in our in, in our kind of uh parliamentary system of you know the, the first past the post really but uh and 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 um in a sense uh starmer is just going through that uh you know going through that process again that he's uh he's he's just uh you know he's um He's returning it to its right wing. Uh, but he's amazingly ruthless about it, I think. And, and it's kind of cack handed in a way as well. And he's also, I think, he's got these, I mean, it is, it is a, you know, it is an anomaly, I think, in many ways. Um, uh, you know, having a knight of the realm and, uh, you know, somebody who's been at the forefront. I don't know why people, you know, people call him a, a human rights lawyer. Well, you know. Yeah, but he was for a bit, but after that, he was a you know he was an agent of the state repression as director of public prosecutions. Ooh, so, uh, <laughs> well, what? How? So how just, you... Come on, come on, justify the Labour Party to me. Come on. Oh, I love that. Oh, cool. Oh, feisty one you are, as <laughs> the in between is. Uh, just a little homage. Um, well, I mean, I suppose the way I would look at it as a socialist is. 
and I didn't vote for. I mean, I, I must say, you are. I mean, I have to accede. Ex- ex- I mean, you're. You know, you campaign and you're in the Labour. I mean, my my job, my role is to stand on the sidelines and sneer. So, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I do a lot of that as well. I'm often accused of doing that. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't I, as a I voted for Rebecca Long Bailey is because I'm on the left and she was the left wing candidate. I've always voted for the left wing candidate in every leadership election. I guess the way I look at the Labour Party is because one thing you just said is our electoral system, and I just think every attempt to create a party to the left of the Labour has died a terrible death because of the electoral system, but also because of the trade union link. Um, obviously, obviously, Labour was founded, unlike other similar parties, to be the political wing of the Labour movement, and uh, that gives it an organic link with working people and their families and so on and their communities. And if that was severed, then I'd be like, well, that's not anything worth claiming or fighting for. But I think because of that, it is. And I think if you can build extra parliamentary pressure and you have a left within the Labour Party, they can have a double-pronged kind of pressure on the leadership. That's my hope anyway. How's that working out for you? Well, I mean, to be fair, we are in the middle of a pandemic, so it's quite hard to mobilise. Yeah. But And then I kind of think, when people say, how's that working out for you? I'd be like, how's it working out? Creating something outside the Labour Party. You know, yeah, so. a, yeah. Well, yeah. Know. If you sort of if you raise people's hopes and then dash them, isn't that worse than you know, worse than sort of raising them in the first place? You know, I, I mean, I was I was happy before Corbyn. I mean, damn you, Corbyn, in a way for raising my hopes. You know what I mean? It's like I was happy just you know sneering at Blair and Ed Miliband, and then and then you fucking raise my hopes. You make me believe. And then my hopes are dashed again. This little fucking wooden Thunderbird puppet is now in charge, you know. It's like, it's tragic. I've, you know, I've suffered, Oof. Owen. Lots of oofs. Can I ask? Um, so one of the reasons Labour didn't win the election both times is that there's a generational divide that's opened up. So when you were railing against Thatcher in 1983, a lot of people don't realise this because there's this kind of caricature of, People start off left wing, then they the University of Life schools them, and they become really, really right wing. But actually, in 1983, when Labour got a kicking, um, you, let, the Tories had a lead amongst young people. They had a lead in every single age group, and young people, people under the age of 25, over 40 percent voted for the Tories. About 33 percent voted Labour. So it wasn't that different from the rest of the population. And in 1987, pretty much easily, even, evenly split the young between Tories and Labour. If you look at 2017 and 2019, young people, and I mean, including, I'm going to throw myself in because under 40, it's tenuous, but under 40, particularly in 2017, no precedent for people under the 14 voting Labour in the numbers they did. But your generation, and there are exceptions, you are one, my mum is one, um, but, Boomers, if we're going to just be really honest about it, overwhelmingly voted Conservative in numbers that are unprecedented. So I would ask, what has happened there? Why are you an exception? You are an exception amongst your generation. Your generation now is overwhelmingly supporting the Conservatives and uh, only a small, less than 20% supported Labour in either election. I'm not doing this for generational warfare thing. I'm just interested as a left-wing boomer why are you the exception when young people are supporting Labour in unprecedented numbers now? Um, well, I think, well, there's, there's several, I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, I, um, you know, because I started out on the left and I never really wanted to make that journey. You know, you do see a lot, you know, there's a lot of those, I mean, a lot of them shits on the right wing of the Labour Party kind of, uh, uh, Started out as left wing, didn't they? And then they sort of, I, 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 they, they, they go through that arc of like becoming right wing. And I kind of never think it's really a, a journey. They've just gone from one being one kind of arsehole to another kind of arsehole. But uh, I never, I was, you know, I just, you know, I believe in being left wing. My parents are left wing, and and you know, my audience is left wing. So there is a, and I never wanted to go on that. I never wanted any of those blandishments of the state. So there's that. Yeah, my own personal um, stance. Uh, 
And I just think being left wing is right. You know, being a socialist, being pro Palestinian, you know, is a is a barometer of of decency. I think. Uh, being, you know, being against uh, exploitation is, you know, is a good thing to be. So there's that. I think I want, you know, I wonder. I suppose what has changed for young people in from my is that their lives were kind of okay during Thatcher. Their lives were still, you know, I was talking about that. You know, that the the, the 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 Thatcher hadn't set about, you know, fully. You know, there was still you could still go to university. You could still get. And you could still rent or buy an house cheap. And now young people's lives are much shittier than, but people my age, their lives are kind of okay still, I think, really. A lot of them, you know, they've got their houses, they've got their pensions. Do you think that's, you know? Yeah, I suppose you're making me that. answer for everybody. You're making me answer for everybody in my generation. No, not at all. I mean, I guess, no, I just find it interesting because, um, that generational divide is is unique. It's it's not really something that's existed. When I saw you on the telly somewhere, you were saying that like somewhere like Turkey, the the young young people are actually really right wing. Hungary really? as well, not great. Yeah, I mean there is so the US, Spain, Britain, like Bernie Sanders was powered obviously a lot by the young, even though he's a septuagenarian. Podemos in Spain again by the young, and Corbyn's Labour was was definitely by 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 the younger in terms of voters. But in other countries it's yeah, it's not a universal law unfortunately. What's the, well, where's the difference then? Why you know with somewhere like Hungary, why? It's complicated. I mean to be fair in Hungary a lot of young a lot of younger people who aren't happy leave. Uh, no. they've had a big exodus of people. I think I do think what's happened here is what you alluded to. I think amongst older Britons, home ownership's gone up since the crash in 2008. Yeah. Quantitative easing puts up their house prices. The triple lock rightly protects their pensions. I support that, of course. Um, so social democracy has been preserved for them, in a sense. So it's not like they need to vote and campaign for social democracy because they already benefit from it. They have universal services, which are correct, even though actually a lot of them undermined. But as well as that, they're often very socially conservative. Not always. Striking exceptions. My mum is one. Uh, but there are, you know, on immigration, multicultural Islam, if you look at that, you know, compared to the rest of the population, whilst younger people have suffered the worst squeeze in wages since the Napoleonic War, housing crisis, secure jobs crisis, youth services slashed, in debt for going to university. Uh, plus, they tend to be more, a lot more socially progressive. So I think it's those two different things. And that's why they should, young people should come and see me. Yeah, you'll radicalize them. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'll super. Well, they're already radicalized. I'll super radicalize them. They say, "There's this old bloke, and he's still, you know, shouting about socialism." And it's what funny. Do you, what do you see the role of political comedy as? Well, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I mean, I think I mean you can get very pretentious, really. But, but I mean, I think there is a kind of a you know the comedians, not all comedians, but you know there is a. You know we are. You know we are the ones who are supposed to, you know, stand. You know, to to criticise the establishment, to criticise power. That is this kind of sacred role. Is I mean, not you know, there's 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 plenty of room for the clown who's merely you know funny. You know, it's not an obligation, but there should be a there should be a you know there 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 should be a, a kind of a cast of comedian that does. The critique's power, really, and that was, I suppose, one of the disappointing things about during the court, you know, the Corbyn era was how most comedians legged it away. You know, you couldn't get somebody more anti-establishment than Corbyn. You know, he wanted rich people to pay their taxes. He wanted the arms industry to stop killing people. You know, he wanted fairness, and you know, really, the, the most comedians, you know, just sneered at him, didn't they, really? Those ideas are very popular, aren't they? So I guess how it's kind of that's why I get optimistic. Millions of people believe in those things. So it's about how we, how yeah, we capture them. yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you know, if there was, if if uh, you know, if there ever was a socialist government in Britain, I hope that I would, you know, I would mock that equally. Really, that would be my that would be be my job. You know, that's the that's the role of the comedy. But it's uh, it's not likely in the near future, really, is it? You wouldn't want to be culture minister. No, no, 
No, uh, no, no, I wouldn't. No, I never. Well, I, I did, uh, on my own podcast, I, I had this idea that I was going to be, if Corbyn had come to power, I'd be def- I would have been defence minister because I'm obsessed. <laughs> Bizarrely, I'm obsessed with weapons and military and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know. What gives you hope? Gives me hope. Oh, I can help. Um, uh, well, you know, there was... Uh, that's a dirty question, isn't it, to ask somebody? Uh, it is, yeah. Yeah, it's a vibe. I'm not, I'm not dare you, about How it. dare you ask me what gives me hope? What a, what a filthy question to ask. Um, Come on, TikTok. <laughs> well, you know, there was, you know, Corbyn started something, you know. I, I hope that it is, um, uh, you know, that, 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 that there will be a, a more coherent and better response next time round, really. As I say, I do. I I think we're living in particularly dark times. But uh, uh, you know, in a way, I don't know. Maybe um, I'm still going. As well. You are very strong. <laughs> do you worry? Just to get really depressing. Do you worry some form of fascism might succeed in the West? Well, it's it, it's a, it's a possibility, isn't it? I mean, it, it's. Um, I mean, we haven't really seen the the fallout from. Uh, the economic fallout from the pandemic yet have we that if uh, if the economy really goes south which it's possible that it will do then you know political extremism really will will possibly be on the rise yeah i worry about that and in terms of just finally i mean a new generation of comics because you've said a lot of comics did sneer but i think of josie long he must be protected at all costs yeah. So, so do you see? Do you see hope in that regard? Do you see that there are actually, in comedy included, people who are because you do get the sort of comedian who punches down and that's their shtick. But then you do have comedians who want to take on the people who actually have power in a funny way. So there is that. Your tradition lives on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they are. They're all. You know, Josie Long. You know. You know. They're all. They're. The, the younger ones, they're all my children, really. Mark Steele, to be fair, is not the younger yeah. than Mark Steele. Yeah, yeah. And Stuart as well. He's my yeah. he's my errant he's my errant nephew, I think. Absolutely love Stuart. We all love Stuart. Yeah. I, I mean it's it's also I suppose, you know, I mean if if um if 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 the times get more fraught then that's you know that can be good for art as well people you know people are forced to take sides people are forced to um you know respond i think so i mean maybe it'll be i i think in a way we're heading for frightening times but maybe artistically they're also very exciting as well maybe that's a, a weird kind of hope and, and if if you were if there's i'm sure there are wannabe comedians watching or listening to this what would you what would you say to them? It, it, well, in, in what sense? Well, I don't know. It's not. It's not. It's a tough gig, isn't it? In, in every regard. Yeah. But what would you? Because also, as you said, you know, one of the things I spoke to with Stuart Lee was about because actually of the attack on the welfare state. It used to be the case that aspiring working class musicians and 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 comedians and artists and writers they had support, and that's gone. And now it's like go and work in a call center immediately, and then you yeah, get hard. Yeah, I know it's 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 very hard. It's very hard. But you know, I mean, I mean, comedy is not. A, you know, if, if you want to be a comedian, and again, it's it, I think it is much harder now. And it's I know Stuart. It's one of Stuart's you know obsessions that it you know it was easier in the past. Um, but if you want to be a comic, then it, it, you can't do it theoretically. You have to find a way to do it. Really, you have to just. Get out there and um, perform, you know. Um, and it's difficult now, you know, it's because there are a lot more posh kids, you know, as in music and in comedy as well. There are, there are, there are a lot more posh kids out there. But you just, I, you know, I can't think of any other way to do it apart from just doing it, forcing your way through, really. And do you think the problem with that is because obviously what, everyone's a prisoner of their background, but the problem is. That if you have so many people from similar backgrounds, then it just becomes harder to have interesting life experiences, which often inform comedy and music. They get taken away. 
Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that sort of, uh, you know, my girlfriend did this, my girlfriend did that. And there's a lot of, you know, you, do, you, you've got to, you've got to try and be more authentic than, you know, just the, the, the banal, uh, you know, you got that. Yeah. And finally, what is the one happy thing? But uh, you, you, <laughs> after, at, when the pandemic subsides and we can just do we can do stuff again, what's your one big yeah. plan? What are you planning? Oh again? God, I don't know. Um, I mean, we're all going to go sort of nuts, aren't we? Really, but uh, uh, I, I, there's there's so there's so many. Uh, I don't know. There's so many. There's so you know. There's there's so much really to. Um, I don't know. So much. It's, it's hard to. Uh, it's hard to. I, I mean, you just you run around the streets, kind of just you know, kind of touching people. I don't. Well, that that might, that might be a bit problematic. Maybe avoid. Like, yeah, avoid, better not. Uh, do it, no. um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I will be. I, I mean, I will be a disgrace in. To imply not connected gonna, to what yeah. you just said in a consensual way, um, yeah. I mean, will you be back touring? Will you be uh, back out on the? Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, yeah. I mean, I was. It's difficult, isn't it? Because it, 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 I mean, I think and I think Stuart said this, and when I was looking on, on your podcast as well, that when I the show that I was doing, which had been written in the latter part of, and which your newspaper, The Guardian, said was the best stand-up comedy of um, 2020. But then Richard Herring very cruelly pointed out that it was probably the only stand-up comedy of 2020, which was I thought was a bit... <laughs> Did you email again? You rude, rude little man. I know, bastard. Oh, um, uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, but it was a perfect show that, like... Um, uh, it... it, it brilliantly summed up the zeitgeist of like late 2019 the the early 2020 you know it was like fantastically uh you know summed up the anger of the post kind of 2019 election and um encapsulate you know and it, it you know you thought well, what could come along that could possibly disrupt that you know what could possibly uh uh you know happen you know, I'll get a good year. I'll get a good two years out of this this show. You know, this is going to remain current and topical. Ah, oh, this will. Oh, I could be able to milk this for two years. Um, and you know, in, in, you know, within two months, it was fucking dead. So I don't know whether I can go out and you know do a show that uh, uh, you know that show. Can, well, like I think Stuart said, can you do? Can you do it like as nostalgia? Uh, you know, do you remember 2019? Do you remember how angry we felt about the election? You know, a lot of the material. So I'm going to have to, like, write a whole new... You know, usually you get two years out of a live show. I got, like, 27 gigs. Um, so I may have to, like, write... And it, the other thing is, I mean, it, whether um, whether people will... Whether they'll only want you to talk about the pandemic or whether they won't want you to talk about the pandemic at all. That's what I can't work out, you know. I'm yeah. trying to work out after the pandemic, like, will there be lots of films and TV dramas about this? Or will people for a long time be like, I don't want to think about this? Yeah, yeah. It's like Hollywood didn't really start making films about Vietnam until like 10, 15 years after, did it really? You know? Yeah, and also I do think, I sometimes think I've got a niece, beautiful little girl, two years old, and I kind of think in 10 years, she'll be like, oh, what was it like? It must have been... So and it's actually quite boring most of the time. Yeah, well, that's, that's certainly true. But it's, it's, it's certainly it's difficult to know. I mean, you'll have to... I think I'll have to... If I'm going to go back to stand-up, then I'll have to go out and, um, you know, just find out what people want to want to hear about, really. Uh, yeah. I mean, who knows? Because it is, as you say, it's like this weird iron law since 2015 that however completely extreme you thought the year before was it will always get more extreme yeah. uh like you know 20, 2016 was like oh now trump's president and then it just carried on going and then at the end of 2019 you're like well this couldn't get any worse at least yeah and there we have it um it was a big honor i can't say your name because i don't want to sell 
my device in the corner. So I will say Mr. Sale. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I hope I wasn't uh, too dull. No, you weren't at all. It was great to chat to you. A a king, a king amongst men and comedians. With a fantastic beard, which gives me. I'm, looking, I'm just looking at my. I look, I'm looking particularly Santa-ish today, aren't I? Really. It seems to be a common thing amongst comedians. Stuart Lee had the similar affliction. I do yeah, get beard yeah, envy. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've not gone through puberty, so uh, <laughs> despite being 36, no, that's that's just not true. I would just, I if I try growing a beard, I look like I'm going through the violent throes of puberty, so I tend to avoid it. Um, but it was a big honour, and uh, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Please support this channel for independent thought discussion of the most important issues that we face.